Six Slayer number one. Six Slayers. Nobody does it better. Like Denzel in the comic realm, I'm the bone collector. Yo, welcome to Six Slayers, the comic signature show, period. I'm Mike the Six Slayer with the honorable villain himself, Mark. What's up, fam? What's up, Mike? Let's go for round two. Let's do it, man. And joining us today is one of the legends in the game, illustrator Howard Chaikin. But before we chat with Howard, though, please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and please, please comment. All right, so let's get started, man. The meat and potatoes of the show. Next up, this artist has drawn everyone's favorite superhero and Jedi. He's worked with Batman, Green Lantern, Conan, The Punisher, his own creations, American Flag, Black Kiss, Hey Kids Comics. Most importantly, this man has given the world the first comic appearance of Star Wars. Ladies and gentlemen of the Stash Land, we bring to you the legendary artist, Howard Chaikin. What's up, Howard? I'm good, but first of all, I'm not an illustrator, I'm a cartoonist. Oh. Which means I write and draw my own stuff, and two, Fuck Star Wars. That who gives a shit? If, that, if that's the most important, if that's the most important thing you can come up with, you're dealing with me when I've then I've been dead for since, since 1977. Fuck that shit. I love Dude. this. I love it. I'm gonna elevate the questions real quick, uh, Mark. Real quick, we're big signature guys, Howard. So you know we we meet artists and and writers all over the, all over the world, all over the country and stuff. And so like for years, people's like, if you want to piss off Howard, do not bring anything Star Wars related to this guy. Did they piss you off or is it like F them in general? I mean, no, I mean, he, the fact is you should never be afraid to bring me something. I, I, I take res full responsibility for any work I've done. Mm -hmm. um, but my disliking it doesn't have anything to do with your liking it any more than your liking it makes it anything to do with mine. Uh, you're entitled to like whatever you like, but just, just because you like something doesn't make it good. You know, um, if, if, you're, if you dig it, you're welcome to do it. And I will sign it because basically I did the work. Wasn't a good idea on my part. I had the, it was the work that I was offered at the time. But you must also understand that my disdain for the work is underpinned by a series of very specific personal and professional notions, right. which have nothing to do with the audience. Gotcha. To be specific, Star Wars has become a secular religion. And if you want to believe in that secular religion, you're more than welcome to do so. But consider me an apostate. That's all I got. Boom, man, I love this guy, I love him. Mark, Mark's Mark been looking at the chops to ask this question to you, so shoot away, Mark. Hey, Howard, I've been waiting for this meetup. Hey, Mark, um, good to see you, man. The legend in this game, I know you from stuff like Black Kiss, Higgins Comics, American Flag, Iron Wolf, uh, Cody Starbuck, so your comic book origin story. How did you land your first gig in comics? I was, I was introduced to comic books when I was four years old, and the the experience I had, I can still bring up the smell of that paper. And at that point, I decided that I wanted to be someone who made this work, who did this stuff. Um, and I started looking for work when I was very young. I started working professionally as an, first as a gopher, then as an assistant, then as a background guy, then as a ghost, and finally under my own work, under my own name and my own work. And I, I saw my, my career if you stretch it back to when I was an assistant, it starts in 1968. So um, I'm, I'm at this for now going on 55 years. Mm -hmm. Under my own name, I started in 1971. So I'm, I've been at this for a while. And um, my experience in comics has been like many others, but different from many others as well, in that I have not had a profound love or interest in superhero material, which is the unfortunate, unfortunately, what what is mostly called for. Nor am I particularly a horror person or a, or a comedy person. I have a, a straightforward uh, style and approach that is best served for, for for depicting observed reality. And I like that observed reality, but observed reality is thin on the ground in mainstream comic books. Most mainstream comic books are about you know super monster, dragon, space, you know mutant stuff. And none of that stuff particularly interests me to a prof any profound extent. Okay, uh, Howard, you brought up uh, the uh, you're a cartoonist, and I I'm really I'm really interested in all the different professions that people uh, do aside from comics. And so when you brought up, uh, I only know you from comic books, 
And so when you bring up cartoonists, and we also know that cartoons also exist in print. So what's the difference between uh, an illustrator, uh, someone calling himself an illustrator or a penciler or a cartoonist? First of all, comic book artists aren't illustrators. Comic book artists are graphic designers in the service of narrative. Uh, their job is to create pictures that are endowed with narrative value and pages that are endowed with narrative value. The cartoonist is someone who writes and draws his own stuff. Uh, I've made it my living as a television writer for 15 years. Uh, I've written and drawn my own comics. I've drawn other people's work and I've written for other people as well. I use an illustrator's techniques within, within the limited framework of what comic books reproduce as to create comic books. But comic books, the, the, the skill set required to do comic books is a, a very specific set of, set of tools. I've often said that it's a pointless and frivolous medium that is difficult to produce well. And I stand by that. Hmm. Um, I, I have never had a commercial footprint of any scale or value in comic books because I don't really care about what the audience thinks about it. And, I, and what, what I identify as good has very little to do with what with the audience identifies as good. It's two very different ideas. Right. And the reason I moved to California in the first place was because I recognized that I had no, no potential, that I may get this old. I didn't expect to get this old, but I did. And I wanted to make certain that when that happened, I wasn't going to be a drag on the system. I grew up on welfare, so I know what it is to be poor. And I had no desire to live an, as an old man in poverty, which is what I was looking at uh, in 1985 when I moved to California. I had to make choices and decisions that directly related to saving my own fucking life. And I did. And every choice I've made to, to make a living outside of comic books has been intended to make it possible for me to continue working in comic books. In the 1970s, when comic books paid completely shit, I did, a, I did a lot of work working as an advertising artist. I would go and spend two or three days a week working at Benton and Bowles, Benton, Barton, Thurston, and Osborne, uh, Ogilvy Mather, J. Walter Thompson, uh, for $150 a day, sitting in a, in, a, in a cubicle, drawing what were called teeny frames, storyboarding commercials, which are a very different job than drawing storyboarding movies. It's a totally different idea. Storyboarding movies, for those who don't know, is, is, is the function of a storyboard in a movie is to explain to the director and the actors and those making the movie what the movie should sort of look like or as storyboards in, in advertising are to convince a client to spend the money that the agency is asking them to spend on an advertising budget. That's the function of it. Mm. And I did that and I did comps, uh, which were magazine illustrations uh, for fo you know to be used as, to, as guides for photographs for a slew of ads, for cigarettes, for, for cotton, for clothing, everything. And my choices to work in television were solely so that I could afford not to be a poor man living in poverty today. And I've succeeded at that. I'm very grateful for that experience I had, but I never worked on a show I'd watch. Um, I don't have any interest in the kind of stuff that my, 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 my resume and my CV generated for me, but I'm grateful for ha having had the work. And when I got fired from my last job, I realized I was done and I'd had enough. And I've, I'm, I'm of the mind that there is enough. You can, ha you can reach a point of enough. And um, I was grateful to reach that point. So 1971, so let's let's fast forward to, to 20, 2023, right? And ask this hypothetical question. Uh, because obviously your entryway into uh, comic books or publishing, the publishing industry w was different than what would be today. If you wanted to enter the industry today, would you even know how to go about that? Not a clue. I have no idea. Um, I mean, I, I stopped. I no longer build for work. I work for free. Um, uh, because I can control my, my universe by not billing any, anybody for any money. Um, I live on my own on my own pension and my own my own financial experience. So I'm not at the mercy of having to convince everybody to give me a job. Uh, by the same token, um, I recognize the fact that getting work in the early 1970s, was a bit easier than it might than it is than it was shortly thereafter. The standards were lower, and there was work. There were pages to be filled. There were also people out there like Neil Adams, who took people under their wing and forced talked editors into giving them work. That's how I got my first jobs. Uh, I was not up to the work that I was given to do. Uh, it, I, I learned how to be a good comic book artist by being a comic book artist for a decade, turning out worthless shit. That would include the Star Wars stuff as well. Um, and in the long run, 
my training was that deckhead. I came back to comic books after working in paperbacks for a couple of years as a painter. That was as an illustrator, Bob. Um, and to do American Flag for First Comics. And to this day, I still don't know why, Ameri why, Flag Com Fla why First Comics had any confidence in me to deliver on the money they offered me to save my life. And it did save my life. I've been a very lucky guy a lot of times. I want to talk about some jazz real quick. What, what's your go-to? Is it Big Band? Is it Harbop? Is it Bebop? Is it, is it, is it Kenny me, G? Just don't say Kenny G. Well, well for me, Kenny G. <laughs> Thank you. Thank uh, you. <laughs> no, for me, um, a lot of it, I mean, it, it starts, I mean, historically, it started because my mother was a, was a big, you know, a fan of the American popular songbook. So I listened to a lot of the stuff she listened to. And I listen, I still listen these days to a lot of early trad just because I, I continually explore the work that was like the, the Lewis's stuff and the stuff that he influenced, you know, with, with uh, you know, with Frankie Trumbauer and Dick Speyerbeck and, and, um, and Jack Teagarden. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, it's, Specific bands. It's always the basic band. It's always the Ellington band, and uh, and then Bop, the Bop stuff, the, the stuff that, that the GIs found when they came home in '45. That was that would have been around for a couple of years. That had not been recorded because of Petrillo, and that 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 decade, that 1955, '45 to 1955. Okay. Uh, the 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 small the small combos, the the the, the trios, the, the quartets, the septets. Um, a lot of the piano bass guys, you know, uh, black and white. You know, I like the I like Oscar Peterson. Yeah, uh, like the I like the, the Cole stuff. I also like Andre Previn. Um, mm. Jim Steranko of all people turned me on to the Previn stuff, which I'd never listened to. Uh, George Shearing, um, and and also you know Art Blakey, you know, and Clifford Brown, uh, you know Sonny Rollins. Um, that's, 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 my, that, that's my birthday twin. Who's that? Sonny Rollins. Sonny Rollins. Who's that? Connie Rollins? Rollins. Yep. Worse. You could do worse. Um, and, and and again, the it, it's the, the early the Miles Prestige stuff continues to kill me. You know, yes. uh, the stuff that he did with Teo Macero. I mean, I like the stuff he did with Gil Evans a lot. Um, but I have to say, I mean, that when when Orion Coleman comes along and the post Coltrane stuff, it loses me a lot. Um, I have a hard time. You know, yeah, the, the Ornette, the Ornette Coleman stuff, I can't get into. Um, I, I, it's funny, you, you're, um, I'm, I'm, I'm digging the era that 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 you honed in on because it's, it's a very like formative like era of sound, and and actually the you know the as we get towards the late fifties and the sixties, they start to commercialize it a little bit, but I I'm a really big you know quartet quintet small combo guy too. My era is 63 to about 65. I, I, I'm a real big Blue Note guy. McCoy Tyner is like like my, my, my favorite pianist. I love Herbie. Uh, Rain Shorter. Um, but, uh, That's a little bit late for me, but I can still yeah. dig it. Howard, during your development as a young artist, can you give us a lesser known name that has influenced you that people rarely talk about? In terms of illustrators, Harry Beckhoff, B E C K H O F F. Uh, Beckhoff is a giant and um, a guy who who made who, who had a very easygoing, uh, a sort of a, an unthreatening and, and casual style that really concealed the brilliance behind the work. And he's never been taken as seriously as, as some of the more more portentous guys, um, the, the impasto painters. But you look at Harry Beckhoff, you look at Robert Fawcett, you look at Austin Briggs. Um, you look at James Williamson, um, an another illustrator of that period. And in terms of comics, you know, you you've heard me say, it, as you say, it's Kniff, it's Sickles, um, it's John Severin, Jack Davis, Wallace Wood, Alex Toth. Um, you know, so, I mean, I'm, I look at everything every day. You know, I'm a great believer in that. You know, it's, uh, you know, I, I have a fairly Catholic and eclectic, eclectic approach to the way I think about the work right now. I'm, I'm, we're working on a, a crowdfunder that's, that's out there and I call for a book called Fargo. Um, we, we launched uh, early this week on, the, on, on Tuesday, I believe it was. And um, I'm encouraging everybody to join, to sign up and join up. It's, a, it's a, a rip snorting adventure book that takes place in the early part of the 20th century um, with a soldier of fortune hero who's sort of, if Conan had joined the Wild Bunch, that's what this is. And I think you'll dig it.
I can feel your influence has had on creators such as Frank Miller and Alan Moore. One example being American Flag as a precursor to Alan Moore's Watchmen and Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns, and two Black Kids acting as a precursor to Miller's Sin City and Moore's Lost Girls. Do you feel that these two works were direct influences on Miller and Moore? I have no idea. I, I have no clue. I really don't. I mean, I'm, I mean, my, I have no idea. I mean, the, the reason, for example, that, you know, Flag is a forgotten book while Watchmen and Dark Knight are remembered is that Watchmen and Dark Knight, as, trans as transgressive as they may have been, uh, still bore the, 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 the specific trope based stuff of masks and capes and, and super duper stuff. And Flag didn't have that. Um, mm. You know, I, I like genre material. I just don't particularly care about the genre that superheroes fits into all the time. So I don't really don't know. I really couldn't say. Um, you know, I, 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 I follow my whims and, you know, and hope, I hope someone will follow me along. But I'm, I'm not necessarily all that concerned about what the audience cares about or thinks. Uh, if, I, if I worried about that, I'd kill myself. And I'm still walking. Mm -hmm. I think Sin City is more Mickey Spillane with capes. You know, with 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 with, with it's superheroes and and in, uh, in, in trench coats, um, and you know I I don't really see it. I I don't. I mean, Black Kiss was simply um, a, a poke in the eye of, of of the comic book business when I did it. Now, of course, it's become a uh, a pornographic international pornographic staple. Um, I'll be doing more. I'm, I'm doing a new. I'll be doing one more a new Black Kiss story next year um, for an omnibus. We're going to finally publish an English language omnibus of Black Kiss. Here's a technical question, Howard, uh, for inspiring artists out there. Um, you, you, let's say you're working on a book, like, like do you have like your workflow mapped out? I, yeah, I work mission. I mean, I, I spent, you know, five years teaching a seminar at Marvel twice a year. And the first day of that seminar was about time management and organization of your, of your career. Um, you know, the problem with many comic book artists is that they don't understand there's a gap that they've leaped from the day they were they see it ceased to be a hobby and became a profession and that you have to manage your life and your career in a way that reflects respect for yourself and for the client the client will not respect you if you don't respect them which is not necessarily say they're going to respect you anyway because many, many of the clients are complete twats but but the truth is you've got to step up to the plate and be a man be a man about it and that and that's what it's about um I, I get up in the morning and I have a pretty serious idea of what must be done before I close my shop every day. Um, and I, I stopped doing full pages about 20 years ago. I now do my figures and my backgrounds on separate sheets and combine them in Photoshop. So that has created a, a different set of production issues. You know, right now I'm waiting for assembled pages from my letterer colorist, my, my, my letterer production guy. Uh, on the last four pages of the back matter that are going to the the volume three trade paperback of eight kids and i'm waiting for colors on the first of the four there, there were there were 11 11 new pages for the black for the trade paperback it's a back cover a two-page untold tales and two four-page gitlin stories uh gitlin is the avatar that plays me in the book and the the first of those all, all but the last four pages uh, have been put through the colorist. I'm waiting for pages from my colorist. I'm waiting for pages from Ken Bruznak, who covers production. So we're moving forward. Uh, it's all getting done. I'm, I'm going to ask you this question. I've always admired your traditional work, like your use of Zipitone. Today, most artists use Photoshop for effects like that. Has your work moved digitally? Or oh, are you still I've... working traditionally? Well, no, 20 some odd years ago, I scanned all my patterns, all my Zipitone. So all my zip is now digital. Um, it's all in there. I mean, the guy that the guy that taught me how to do this is in. You know, I'm, I'm, I've been back and forth with him on Facebook and, and and text all morning. He's in New York right now for the New York show, and, um, and and he's the guy who basically said, "Do it this way, not that way." And I said, "Okay, I'm good with that." Your line work is all your sketches are is all digital, I, also. That's, no, that's all hard. I do my figures and backgrounds all in hard copy. Then they're scanned, mm -hmm. then they're combined. Photoshop, and then patterns are added. And so in the 50 plus years of your professional comic creating experience, is there a forgotten aspect of comic creation that you'd like to bring back? Um, no. Aside, no? no I'm, I'm really, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I like the way I work now. I mean, it, it creates, I mean, yeah, I'm, 
I, I don't have an I don't have a, an ounce of, of any nostalgia in my body. I'm not. I mean, I don't crave the good old days. I, I like the now, and uh, I'm good with that. You know. Um, if you had an unlimited budget and absolute mind control over comic book readers, <laughs> what genre of comics would you create? For your dream story in the in the current, because obviously you know your your artists, there's always new stories to tell. But right now, what would you say? I had an unlimited budget. I'd never work again. I'd say to hell with this shit. I'm out. I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's a waste of time and energy to chase the comic book audience. They they uh the comic book audience and I have no have no nothing in common other than the than, than the tools we 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 play with. Um, and I I I have no no faith or hope. Um, in finding a commercial footprint before I leave. I'm old, man. I'm 73 years old. And, you know, at my age, I'm in my victory lap at this point. I'm perfectly happy with that. I mean, we Keith Giffen died earlier this week. He was three years younger than me. Rest in peace. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm just grateful not to be dead. So I, got, I, don't, I don't think about that. I mean, for me, it's the job that's on my... Right now, right below my eyes right now, below, below, below the screen is the the thumbnails and rough and rough materials for the for the script i'm working on for that fargo project i mentioned mm -hmm. uh, so it's just all about next intended thing and what's the next intended thing is to get this fucking script done i know you're involved in some exciting projects is there anything else that we haven't talked about besides black kids besides fargo that you want fans to know about or more about fargo because that sounds exciting i'll give you the whole rundown right now the legal hurdles on Times Squared have been solved, and we are going to be bringing that, that book will be out next year, finally. Uh, three years late, but it's done, and long done. Um, the, the, the trade paperback, paperback of volume three of Hey Kids, uh, The Schlock of the New, will be out this Christmas. Fargo will be out. We're, 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 go join our, our crowdfunder there. Like, check, check out my Facebook and Facebook page and find that link and sign up. And um, that's about it. I got nothing else. I mean, that's plenty. That's plenty. That's plenty. That's, that's, that's right in front of you, literally. Howard, thank you so much for joining us, man. Thank you for answering the Star Wars question. I've been wanting to answer it. We've been debating on one answer. So I wanted to get that out there. And I loved, I loved how you responded to it. Mike, like we have to like take you on the back and beat the shit out of you. Get, to get that taken care of. I'll, I'll, have, I'll delegate it. <laughs> hey, <laughs> thanks so much, guys. Thanks, thanks again for having me really grateful no problem well that's all for our show if you like what you see please subscribe and hit the like button this is the six slayers i'm mike speaking for mark honorable villain and the legendary howard chaykin we are out six